Beyond the shallow coastal waters, sloping down to the flat abyssal plain of the deep sea, lies a world of unique habitats and fascinating creatures. This is the continental margin. Let's take a closer look and explore this exotic world and the unusual communities which thrive here. Our first stop is this deep canyon, a characteristic feature of the continental shelf. Many animals choose to live here because the canyon's shape provides a rich source of food. Depending on the weather at the surface, food can be washed down from the land and the teeming upper waters, which can themselves be nourished by deep ocean water being drawn upwards through the canyon. At first glance, these strange shapes may appear to be plants, but they are actually sea animals. Animals that can't swim about need to find firm rocky places to attach themselves, and there are plenty of good homes here. These brisingids are related to starfish. They are filter feeders, which means they catch and eat tiny particles of food floating in the current. Frilled sharks are found in deep water all over the world. This one has come to the canyon for a sheltered place to give birth to its young. But life in the canyon is not without risks. Behaving like an underwater avalanche, turbidity currents are a dangerous prospect for some canyon residents. However, many other creatures at the bottom of the slope will benefit from food in the falling sediment. Near the bottom of the continental margin slope, we find a cold seep community. These places look a bit similar to hydrothermal vents, but both the creatures here and the underlying geology are in fact very different. While hydrothermal vents are a result of volcanic activity, cold seeps occur where waters enriched in methane are forced upward through the sediments. Gases rise through the sea floor and erupt at the seep site, nourishing the community of animals from below. Bacteria such as these are able to make food from the seep chemicals and become the foundation of all life here. Some animals eat the bacteria directly. Other animals have evolved to have the bacteria within them and benefit from the food they make. In this symbiotic relationship, both creatures benefit, like these tube worms and the bacteria inside them. The tube worms are very long-lived compared to their relations at hot vents. These worms live for up to 250 years. The clams and mussels also have symbiotic bacteria living inside them. Squat lobsters live around the seep. They are scavengers and also prey on smaller animals. This is a mixture of methane and ice. Ice worms spend their whole lives living in the ice and feed on bacteria which are sustained by the methane. Chemicals coming from under the seabed form the basis for the food chain at this community. In most places along the margin, however, food filters down from the upper waters. Sea cucumbers usually creep along the seabed. This one is feeding. It belongs to an unusual swimming species called Enipneastes. Although this area of the seabed looks empty, just under the surface there are thousands of worms, crustaceans and other small animals living on the food which falls from above. Wind-driven upwelling can concentrate food, plankton and larger animals in margin waters. These algae and plankton sink when they die. The microbial decay process uses up a great deal of the oxygen in the water. The process also releases carbon dioxide, making these waters acidic. The lack of oxygen creates oxygen minimum zones, which begin between 50 and 500 meters depth, and end gradually at around 1,000 meters. These depths vary around the world, depending on local currents and conditions. 
the zones are found in several regions of the world. Relatively few species can tolerate the conditions within oxygen minimum zones, making them less diverse than the rest of the continental margin. But they are still home to many individual creatures. Oxygen levels decrease quite sharply as we descend into the zone, and then increase more gradually as we descend further and emerge below. Together with related changes in light levels, depth, acidity and other factors, this means that zonation of the animals in their habitats is common. Back in the middle part of the zone, the most severe lack of oxygen means that there is little diversity, and most of the organisms that live here full-time are bacterial colonies, foraminifera, and soft-bodied worms. These bacteria need sulfide to survive, but can exist with very little oxygen. Foraminifera are single-celled creatures with tiny shells that build up in layers on the sea floor. Tiny nematode worms live in the sediment all over the world, but are particularly abundant in the oxygen minima. Larger polychaete worms like these survive by having very large gill areas. Oxygen minimum animals don't dig burrows as much as others. This means that the sediment here isn't churned up as much as normal and forms these characteristic undisturbed layers called valves instead. Going slightly deeper, the conditions change such that a different organism will dominate. Here, there is a little more oxygen, allowing brittle stars, shrimp, and spider crabs to become established. Animals that can tolerate low oxygen do well because there is plenty of food in the zone. This is because animal matter falling from above does not decay as much as usual. The bacteria causing decay need oxygen too. So these jellyfish from the upper water provide a rich meal. Armstrong spider crabs have much larger gills than other kinds. As well as the benthic animals, which live on or near the seabed, many pelagic species which swim in the water can be found here. Many of these animals cope by spending part of their time in better oxygenated water above or below the zone. These rat tails are among those that have adaptations to the chemicals in their blood so that they can extract oxygen from the water better. For other animals, like this squid, living in the oxygen minimum zone means slowing right down. Less activity means a slower metabolism, less oxygen and energy needed. The oxygen minimum zone can also be a refuge from predators. Oxygen minima are presently healthy features which contribute to ocean biodiversity overall. They provide niches with few predators which can be exploited by specialist animals and they can increase the amount of food reaching the sea floor. They also bury carbon, helping the ocean control the planet's climate. However, global changes to ocean temperature and chemistry are expanding the zones considerably. As they get larger, the habitat available to animals which can't tolerate low oxygen gets smaller, and their survival will become more difficult. These animals will be concentrated in smaller areas and become more vulnerable to predation and fishing. Here we see a deep water reef made by Lophelia coral. Over time, the skeletons of past corals have built up into a huge structure by attaching to the rocks on the sea floor. Coral animals are called polyps, 
They eat little particles of food which they take from the water current. Laopithes glabarima is a black coral. This species does not form large reefs like Lophelia, but a single colony like this one can be a thousand years old. The coral framework supports a whole host of animal life, such as this bizarre creature called a basket star. It catches little pieces of food with its arms, then passes them into its mouth. In 1818, this was one of the first deep sea creatures found by scientists. Even so, it was widely believed for many years afterward that there could be no life at this depth. Orange roughy fish often come to the reef to find food, but they are frequently caught by humans. They grow very slowly and, if not caught, have one of the longest known lifespans of any fish. Trawler fishing is very destructive when seen from below. It's easy to overlook the damage that humans can do out of sight on the slope to the deep ocean. Already weakened by the exploitation of resources, some of these habitats are further threatened. Global changes are acidifying parts of the ocean and depleting its oxygen. Because of the astonishing variety of habitats on the continental margins and the life they support, it's vital that we preserve, protect and appreciate this unique part of our planet.